Hey everyone, my name is Rit and we are here. This is going to be week number six of the NCP Nimbus Division. We are up against Owen Ogalbina and his Shanghai Dragapults, if I'm not mistaken. Now, this is a really scary matchup, right? So he has a lot of threats. Obviously, you can see just on the screen, the Gengar Hydreigon Core is a really, really strong one that's been drafted a bunch of times since this new generation. Also has the Virizion, which really stops a lot of what I'm trying to do here. And the Slurpuff, which can sweep me on its own. But also the Sanaconda. The Sanaconda is a extremely scary just because it stops a lot of my offensive pokemon from doing what, whatever the heck they want to do here but also just on his team he has a jolteon which i know he doesn't like but does prevent my team from doing some of the things that it wants to do and i was deathly afraid of the bronzong which doesn't come here but one of the things that i had to think a lot about as well but for instance to the cloister now i 100 percent expected the bronzong over the cloister in this type of situation but it's gonna have to be something that i deal with here but yeah you can see here i have an assault vested caparajo which i thought was really interesting because it takes hits really really well from gengar and hydreigon and can oko them back i had to invest just a little bit to ensure okos on gengar but uh, Hydreigon, I just want to do damage to it and kind of deal with it. Sylveon uh, was kind of freed up to kind of take a hit and really hit back with a really, really strong modest specs hit here. Arcanine is really just here as kind of a defensive pivot, just kind of intimidating the Verzeon, making sure that it can't just blatantly swords dance up on me i can roar it out i also want to try and roar out the slurpuff if that's at all possible it looks like he has a lot of setup threats that made roar really really attractive to me in this matchup especially i can get an intimidate off i can either try to get a toxic get a flamethrower off and or try to roar also just a specs dragapult i feel like the shadow ball spam is really free so i really wanted to try to abuse the team make a build that can kind of click buttons a little bit because i do have a lot of threats to deal with but i don't want to skip out on kind of offensive presence here so i want to have as much of that offensive presence as I possibly can here so a uh, specs drag point felt really solid to me and with these last two slots I have the Malamar and the Dove Wool uh, two mods that I really, really think have a solid matchup here, but I really wanted to bring things like the Milotic. I thought the Milotic was a really, really strong bring for things like the Sanaconda and just things in general that can stop a lot of things you want to do. And I also really wanted to bring a Rhydon, a really specially defensive Rhydon, because that felt like it also had a really solid opportunity to kind of deal with a lot of his really strong threats here. But at, at the end of the day, it was really difficult for me because if, I felt like if I brought those mods that I didn't have a proper Earthquake switch in, which I desperately needed for the Sanaconda, or else the Sanaconda could just sit there toxic my entire team and just kind of wall the rest of my team if it's some crazy coil set right so I, I desperately needed an earthquake switch in my double felt like it would do the trick so my double here is kind of meant to it's a pretty standard set just sub cotton guard with body press and i believe the last move is just to hit the gengar i think it might be zen headbutt but yeah it's just it just covers a lot of what he's trying to do here and i felt like the malamar had a solid situation here so like i said i really did want to bring the ride on as well as the milotic in those last two slots but I felt like those two kind of left me a little bit lacking in an offensive presence. And I thought a Scarf Malamar here could really give me a lot of what I was missing in terms of that offensive presence. And if I put some offensive pressure here, then I feel like I can do the things that I need to do in this matchup. So that's where my head was at just in team building. And with that, I'm just going to get right into the match. Okay, so leading off was pretty difficult for me. Uh, I definitely can't lie about that, but I do end up leading with a Sylveon because it felt like the, the things that he would be most likely to lead, uh, Sylveon can kind of deal big damage to and at least not let him like super hazard sack me. And when I see the Cloister, I'm kind of thinking he could be, um, th this could either be some kind of an anti-lead or a or a spikes lead so he does reveal the toxic spikes and i do kind of get a hyper voice off here which deals a whole lot of damage it brings him down to sash on a crit so interestingly enough i am specs i believe i might have brought it to brought him to sash anyway but the fact that i did crit on that turn does mean that he's not going to know that i'm specs quite yet i believe um but now i have to decide what i want to do here i believe i can take most hits that this thing would, would, would want to go for especially if it's not set up and i really do want to prevent the setup even though getting toxic spikes on my side of the field is really bad for me right I, my best my only removal for the my, my entire team is eldegoss and uh it's not here so i he sees that i don't have any removal at all so i'm kind of in this position where i kind of have to figure out um i kind of just have to manage these toxic spikes as best as i can but uh he reveals the explosion and the explosion straight up ko's now i believe i ran some counts after this match and uh, I believe that was maybe like a 30%, even less, to KO. It was a pretty aggressive roll um, that he got. I believe it was at least 60% in, in my favor to to take it, but I believe it was, it was more than that. I would have to uh, run those numbers again, but... 
That was very much in my favor to take, and having Sylveon around for another turn would have at least gotten me some sort of momentum, but here in comes the Sandaconda, right? And this is pretty much my biggest fear, because this Sandaconda, uh, I really don't want to get hazard sacked, first of all, and I really don't have many good good switches into this thing, uh, so even though Copperaja kind of puts on offensive pressure, I really can't just kind of... Um, sit in here so i'm thinking about whether or not i, I want to switch in but i uh, but i can't let this thing coil um if this thing wants to rocks up i believe i can two it ko it so i think that's where my, my mind's at in terms of wanting to uh power whip it um if this thing does coil then it does put me in a little bit of trouble but it's just something that i'm gonna have to deal with next turn after uh my my operating assumption here is that he's gonna want to go for rocks here and i could use that as an opportunity to two it ko potentially but um he ends up going for the coil which is pretty much worst case scenario here as i can go for the power whip and i believe yeah that is really bad damage but it does look like i would have done around half um without the coil boost but it looks like leftovers would have brought him out of 2 ko range so now i have to figure out something that i want to do and he might see that i'm not terribly offensive uh Kaparaja. i am built to take hits from those big two um the the gengar and the and the uh high dragon so here i'm like i said i'm just trying to figure out what to do like i said i don't have very good uh earthquake switches i never had them on on my team other than maybe the eldgoss which uh i obviously don't have uh which maybe i should have brought i don't know i don't know maybe this is a misplay on my part but i i i decided the best thing that i can get uh Poisoned here is the Malamar, and I can at least take a hit, and then I can try to hit it back, but that coil boost really does a lot of damage at, uh, on the next turn with an Earthquake. But what this does mean is that I can get a really, really strong knockoff on something, and I can try to go move on from there, right? So obviously, this Malamar is not in the best position anymore. It's not going to ever win me a game in, in late game, but it was never really meant to do that anyway. I really just wanted um, uh, some big offensive presence some some big damage from this mon uh, but yeah just two earthquakes kind of kind of do it to me and that was like that was one of the biggest weaknesses of this build um part of me was afraid that, that the double would have been too too obvious and if he preserves his sandaconda enough then then switching on the double wasn't ever going to do what do what i needed to in terms of getting damage onto the sandaconda or getting damage onto other mons in the back so i played this the way that i felt like i had to play it in the moment but looking back on it, maybe uh, just forcing the Sandaconda out would have been the best play. But um, the point is, by bringing it in, in the Malamar, I bring the Sandaconda down to around half-ish. As well as um, knocking off the, uh, the leftovers, which is a lot better than just having the, the double force the Sandaconda to squish out. And then being put in a not great position from there. So I can bring in the Dragapult. And like I said, I'm just wanting to put on offensive pressure on uh, onto his team. I can get off a spec Shadow Ball. And here, he brings in the Slurpuff, which is incredibly scary, but being Specs means that I do around 70% to this thing, and he does get the Citrus Berry back, he won't outspeed me. And here's a moment where I just felt like... First of all, m my first thought when this Slurpuff came in was that it was going to be some kind of a Calm Mindset, and that it was in that it was not going to be like that offensive of a Slurpuff. And that made me think that if I switch out and give him an opportunity to, to call mine up for free, then I'd be put, be put in a pretty bad position. And I honestly did not expect this thing to want to belly drum on me. But he belly drums regardless. And uh, he definitely didn't, didn't expect me to stay in. But I honestly felt like I could not let this thing set up. I And I thought it was going to be much more likely that this thing was kind of like a, a, a weaker calm mindset than just a straight up... Um, and just a straight up belly drum set so like i said part of me felt like he was going to want to preserve that thing for kind of um wish protect calm mind shenanigans later on in in the match um that was a lot more of what i was thinking that sort of buff would be much more than just a straight up belly drum set but i could have just lost dragapult for absolutely free um i could have 100 percent called that one wrong and i partially did he could have just play roughed me taken me out but here in, in comes the, the Verzian, and I'm kind of wondering what this Verzian can actually do to me. Um, I believe I'm thinking through my options here, but I believe I end up trying to hit this thing with a Shadow Ball just to gauge damage. Just try, just try to see what this Verzian would really have for me. Um, because obviously, uh, I'm not afraid of its dual stabs, and 
spec shadow ball is going to do something but here is he just how specially defensive it is this is a very um bulky version so now i have to figure out what exactly i want to do here i do have the arcanine as kind of a fail save here but um I can't let him call mine here, so I believe I've, I've realized that I cannot allow this uh, Verizion to continue to do whatever the heck it wants to do, and I have to, have to, have to get in my Arcanine to at least force something here. Whether I try to get a Toxic off, which is super risky because I really don't want to let this thing sub up, although if it is sub call mine, then that would leave it up to dual stab, and it really doesn't touch Dragapult very well, but maybe it's just trying to boost past any damage that I would do. Uh, to the version with Calm Mind anyway, so I don't know. Th these are all things that are going through my mind in this moment, but he does reveal the Synthesis, which is really, really scary. But it does mean I could theoretically get a Toxic off on this thing. And uh, I don't quite know this thing's coverage yet, right? I, I have to assume that it has Grass coverage, um, because otherwise it would have a really bad matchup against my Milotic, and things like Rhydon just think, just, um, Grass coverage seems optimal here. And one would assume it would also need a, a, a fighting coverage, in particular for my Kavaraja or something to that effect, but uh, he does switch out, so I don't even get to know quite, quite yet. Um, and I am able to roar out the the Hydreigon, and I bring out the Gengar, which is pretty not great for me, but uh, in this moment, what my thinking is here... I can get some type of chip damage onto this Gengar. I believe I can take a hit, and I believe I can hit this thing back uh, to try to do some chip damage, and I think that's going to be moderately important for taking a hit later on uh, in the match with one of my Mons and then being able to take this thing out. Um, that's where my head was at. I was trying to look at look at the longer game, even if I lose my Arcanine here in this moment. Um, it doesn't look like my Arcanine is going to play too big a role, given the fact that the Verizion is as bulky as it is, and... Um, just the way that th that is team is is composed it doesn't look like arcanine is going to have the biggest role here and it feels like arcanine's biggest role here is going to be to try to get some chip damage here so we do take the sludge wave decently well and we are able to do just under half with the flamethrower so i'm feeling okay about this interaction not great but um but again, um, I'm, I'm just thinking that, that the Intimidate's a lot less useful because of the, the, the Verzian special. Slurpuff's already down, so I can't roar that out. And um, I don't switch well into into um, Santa Conda anyway, and there's no Bronzong. So I'm thinking there, uh, that the Mons in the back are a lot more valuable here, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to think about all my options. Part of me is thinking about trying to take hits with my Kavaraja. But obviously that's less optimal in this situation, and I can't even extreme speed, but he does switch out, which uh, is super interesting to me. And I just stay in in Morning Sun. Um, yeah, I guess I was just taking my options with Morning Sun just in case he wants to switch out here. But now that this on Santa Conda is moderately weakened, um, it does mean that it, it I mean it might it doesn't mean that I take any hits here, but it does mean that I outspeed and I get a little bit of initiative, so I can either try to um, flamethrower for a little bit of extra chip damage, or I can try to get off a toxic. And I try to get off a toxic, even though I am m pretty strongly fearing, moderately strongly fearing, um, uh, moderately strongly fearing a coil rest set. But we're just kind of dealing with it in this moment. We let the Arcanine go down, um, which is not great, but again. I'm playing the game to try to chip down this Anaconda, and now I can try to bring up my, my double and try to start to deal with some threats. But um, here, I'm, tr I'm starting to think that my double can get some extra value by not only trying to switch into this Anaconda, but also just try to um, take take other ones out with him in case he wants to make any plays here. So I go for the sub, thinking that it's going to be the, my best play. Obviously, I, I, I'm, I'm already poisoned, so it's not going to be anything against Anaconda, but if... Uh, he seeks to turn to Coil, and and I can play any Cotton Guard games, then uh, we can get things going from here. And I believe I did check out some type of calcs where um, I might be able to, t to take an Earthquake if it's like no investment. But regardless, w w we're here. The Hydreigon comes straight in. So this does mean that I potentially get two hits off on this Hydreigon, right? And um, I just end up going for a body press because i know body press is going to do the most amount of damage that i can do in this moment and like i said i'm trying to calc out and 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 i'm just hoping that that this is like some sort of a scar type dragon i don't exactly know his team composition that well in terms of items so i'm just kind of assuming here that i can 
take one extra hit and hopefully to a KO with, with Body Press. And if the Gengar comes in, then I can maybe deal with that by going for an Earthquake. Or no, I, I believe I have Zen Headbutt on this team on this uh, build. But regardless, he goes for the Dark Poles and it takes me out. I just took too much chip due to um, due, due to that poison. So that's unfortunate, but it, it's going to be what it is. Now here is where I'm thinking uh, in the back of my head, right? How do I how do I want to manage this? Because he has the Gengar, he has the Hydreigon, right? I know the Copperaja can take hits from both the Hydreigon and the and the uh, Gengar, depending on on how they're built. Unless they're both specs, I believe I can take hits from from both of them. Um, and I'm just trying to calc out whether or not I can KO with with um with cop of. Uh, Dragapult's U-turn because if that's that was enough chip damage to to KO with a modest U-turn, then I believe I'm in a fantastic position because then my Copperaja can take hits from any Gengar possible and I can potentially win uh, this match. That's where my head's at right now. So I pop the U-turn. Oh, and and the Verzian as well. I know that the Verzian's there, but. My thinking is that the Copperaja can take hits from two out of three of those mons, but I can't take hits from all of them, right? So if I let out my, my Copperaja, I can 100% take out the Hydreigon, but then, but then um, I'm, I'm weakened to the point where I struggle against the other two mons. So those are the things that are going through my head, but if I U-turn out, then my Copperaja can deal with both the Verizion and the Gengar. That's that's where my head's going. That those are all the things that are going through my head. But now he reveals the Sandaconda, and I 100% forgot going into that turn. I forgot that the Sandaconda was still there. Be and we talked after after this match, and it turns out that my assault vested Kafraja was more than strong enough with its assault vest to take on to take hits from both the Gengar and the Verzian. Um, but like I said, I just completely forgot that the, that the Sandaconda was there. I was really stressed out about the match, and I honest to God thought that it was down to Hydreigon, uh, Verzian, and and Gengar, and that's why I was stressing out so much about that U-turn count because I really needed that U-turn to KO, and I believe it may or may have been a slight roll, but um, if I was able to 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 U-turn and the Copperaja just had to deal with, with with the Verzian, I believe we did calcs, and the Verzian would have had to landed two focus blasts. The Verzian would would have to have landed two focus blasts. Uh, and then th this Gengar is very clearly scarfed um, for my Dragapult, which we found out after after the match. But I always take hits as as long as th the only way, sorry, the only way that he wins would be to land two Focus Blasts and then Gengar cl uh, cleans out the match. Or if he wanted to shore up the Calc, and, and again, he doesn't know yet that I am Assault Vested, but if I'm not Assault Vested, he would need a, a, a Co Mind up in order to... Straight up Oko, uh, even a non-assault vested Copperaja. So if he combines up, then I 100% take a plus one Focus Blast from Verizion into a Scarf Shadow Ball from Gengar. And Copperaja could have won the match in that way um, with him not knowing until the very, very final turns that I was assault vested. But it was the Sandaconda. That, like I said from the very beginning, the Sandaconda stopped a lot of what I was trying to do in this matchup. And me not being able to, to handle the Sandaconda, it looks like was the difference in this matchup because the, um, between the, my Dragapult and my Copperaja, we could have 2v3'd that combination of Gengar, Hydreigon, and Verizion after all of those other mons came through. But yeah, it was super unfortunate. I just didn't have any answers to the Sandaconda. It was a super unfortunate way for me to lose this match. Uh, I thought that I built decently well. I thought that it was a really fun match and I thought that I played decently well, but there were a lot of holes in my team building that I wish I had addressed. Obviously, that roll on Cloyster, uh, onto my Sylveon, on turn one was super unfortunate because I really wanted to um, be able to at least keep it around. Even even if it was around for a sack in, in the later game, in the mid to late game, that would have been huge. I feel not great about how I played certain parts of my matchup. Having to bring the Malamar and, and the double, I think they were weak links and I think it ultimately hurt me. But it felt difficult to justify the other mods, especially when it just made me soft to, to Sandaconda. I was really soft to, to EQ spam. And uh, that's, again, just ultimately how we ended up losing this match. Like I said, it was still really, really fun. And thank you guys so much for watching. We'll be back really, really soon with more weeks of the NCP Nimbus, more weeks of the TBL, as well as more weeks of the AP Academy. But with that, once again, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll be once again out.